Hey, welcome back to the channel. My name is Troy Mayers and I am pumped. Pumped to have you here. In today's video, we're gonna rank the top five hybrid mirrorless cameras. Let's get after it. Here we are at the end of 2022, looking into 23, and we have some incredible tools at our disposal as camera operators, as content creators, as DPs or cinematographers, as photographers, whatever title you go by, man, there are some great offerings out there on the market for us. It seems like every brand at any given price point has a great camera, has a great tool for you to use to get your job done. As someone who loves gear, that's really exciting, but can also be really kind of overwhelming and hard to keep up with everything that's out there. We're, we're flooded with different specs and resolutions and frame rate options and megapixel counts. <sighs> so the question is, which one's the best? In today's camera ranked chart, we're gonna look at the best hybrid mirrorless camera bodies for 2022. Now, in order to do that, I think we need to set the groundwork, build a little bit of foundation to work off of. And, and the first part of that foundation is gonna be who are these hybrid cameras geared towards and who are they best suited for? Well, in my opinion, I think hybrid cameras are great for run and gun content creators, those of us that uh, are often carrying all of our gear on our pack, we're working solo, maybe we have a small crew that helps us out, but we're creating social media content, website content, things that are gonna live online. We'll need to create both photos and videos out of just one day shoot, one day on location, we need to be able to deliver both to our client. So those are our run and gun style content creators. The next category I believe are, are minimalist filmmakers, those of us that don't really want to get bogged down by all of the gear that we could use on a shoot to capture an image. They want to strip it down to just the bare essentials. That could mean one camera body and one zoom lens, maybe like a 24 to 70, right? Something that's very versatile in a lot of scenarios. Strip it down, make it as minimalist and simple as possible so they can focus on their craft of storytelling and, and, and crafting the best images they can. So those are minimalist filmmakers and I think that the third category of, of people hybrid cameras are great for are those of us looking for, say, a B cam, maybe for more video focused like I am. We have our A cam and we're looking for a suitable B cam that A will match well with our A cam, but also probably be a little bit smaller, pack down a little bit easier, and have photo capabilities. I know my A cam doesn't have photo capabilities. So that's kind of our third category is, is looking for a B cam. So, those are the different people I think a B cam is great for. So that's the first part of the foundation, getting an understanding of where these hybrid cameras really shine and who I think they're best suited towards. Now, the second part of this groundwork that we're gonna lay is understanding what we're looking at as we build out this ranking system, how we decide what's number one and, and what doesn't make the list. And really, because we're looking at hybrid cameras, it's all about how both photo and video capabilities mesh together along with ergonomics. So on the photo side of things, we're looking at sensor size and, and megapixel counts. On the video side, we're looking at uh, frame rate options and, and internal codec recording options. And then ergonomically, how the two mesh together, size, weight, uh, input and outputs, things of that nature. And that's our baseline. That'll give us a good foundation moving forward. The last thing to talk about are the prerequisites to make it onto this exclusive camera list, the top five hybrid mirrorless cameras for 2022. And those prerequisites are, first, there has to be a full frame camera. I know, I have no love lost towards Super 35s, towards APS-Cs, towards Micro Four Thirds cameras. This is a Super 35, I'm shooting this on a Super 35 on the C70. So I, I have no reservations toward those, but all things being equal, if everything else is the same and you're looking at just the difference between a Super 35 and a full frame sensor, I think in order to be the best camera, it's gonna to have to have a full frame sensor. If nothing else for the increased light capturing capabilities as well as the increased depth of field options, right? So full frame sensor is gonna be the first prerequisite. It's also every camera on this list is gonna be able to capture 4K at 60 frames per second. I think that's an important metric for a good video side of things. They're also gonna feature their own version of an IBIS, the in-body image stabilization. And there's one more thing, dual native ISOs. They're all gonna have dual native ISOs. These prerequisites are gonna help make these hybrid cameras very versatile in the way that they're gonna be used by our three different categories of content creators that we listed. I probably put them over here actually. Our three different categories of content creators are gonna really benefit 
from those prerequisites. Okay, enough talk, let's get into it. In fifth place, the Lumix S5 from Panasonic. Now there's a couple of reasons why I think this makes a great hybrid camera. And the first being the 24.2 megapixel sensor. I think that hits a real sweet spot for hybrid cameras, somewhere in the 20 to 30 megapixel range. You know, there's obviously cameras that have a much higher megapixel count and then ones that have a much lower megapixel count. And usually the lower megapixel count makes for a better video camera and the higher megapixel count makes for a better photo camera. And when it comes to being a true hybrid and being capable of both, um, I think it's great to fall into that 20 to 30 megapixel range. So the Lumix S5 is great for that. The next pro that I'm gonna to give to this hybrid camera is gonna be hands down the price point. I mean, to, to make it onto this list, we had a pretty extensive set of prerequisites. And this camera comes in just under 1700 US dollars. <sighs> That's crazy. That's incredible that the capability that you're getting for such a low cost of entry. However, the S5 just barely made it onto the list. It does have the 4K60 prerequisite, but to do it, it has to crop in on that full frame sensor. And in doing so, it also drops to a 420 color subsampling, which means we're getting less color information in our internal recording. So that's gonna be a negative, keeping it towards the bottom. The other thing that comes with the S5 is the L mount. I don't particularly love the L series of lenses, especially when compared to what Sony's doing with the E mount, what Canon's doing with the RF mount. Having a native L mount, doesn't provide a lot of versatility for my use cases. So that's gonna be another thing that keeps it at that fifth place spot. Moving on, our fourth place camera is the Canon R5, which means that this is a powerhouse list for the R5 to take the fourth spot because it is an incredible camera. I think the first biggest pro of the R5 is that it has a native RF mount. I'm a huge fan of the RF lenses and I'm a big advocate for what the future of these lenses are going to be. I've actually done a video on that, which I'll put on the screen here, as well as in the description below. Check that out when the video is over um, to dig into that a little bit deeper. But I think it's incredible and RF lenses can't be adapted to any other camera. So this R5 having that native mount is a real pro. I think another pro of the R5 is going to be the actual button layouts, the customizability of the buttons, is, and by extension of that, the menu system is very straightforward. There are some other menu systems in other cameras that is a little bit clunky, and I find Canon systems to be pretty good. All of this to say that when you get on set, when you get on location to start shooting and creating that content, it's going to be very straightforward. It's gonna be very easy to operate um, a, with the customizable buttons, and B, when you do need to get into the menu system, which isn't often, but when you do, it's all right there. So those are a couple of pros of the R5, but it's not all sunshine and rainbows. As far as a hybrid camera goes, this has a very high megapixel count. It's well outside of that sweet spot that I mentioned uh, with the S5. The R5 from, from Canon is closer towards 50 megapixels, which is gonna make this lean pretty photo heavy. It's an incredible photo camera, and as a result, some of the video side of things take a bit of a, take a, bit of a hit. Uh, and, and the first one, the thing that has plagued this camera since day one is the overheating. I know current firmwares have, have helped to address this issue, but I think this is always gonna be one of the things that you just kind of deal with when it comes to the R5. And that's, that's a bit of a bummer. You know, I, I, I have a hard time really trusting that on a paid shoot worrying that it might not be able to record or, or shoot any more photos or, or videos on the day because the camera just can't keep up. That's a real drawback and why I personally don't have one in my arsenal. Another real con of the R5 is gonna be the recording limits. It does have a 30 minute record limit when shooting videos and that's, that's gonna be a non-starter for me. Our third place camera is gonna be the Sony Alpha One. Sony's flagship camera. And I think there are two things that really define this camera. The first is an incredible backside illuminated stack sensor. This is a great piece of technology that they have inside of the A1. When I look at a camera to decide if it's gonna be the right one for me, the sensor is the first thing that I look at. The whole camera is built to house the sensor. So I think it's a pretty important thing to get right. And the A1 gets it right. The other interesting thing about the A1 is its compact design by nature. It's a flagship camera and traditionally flagship cameras 
are much larger than the A1 is. It often has a built-in vertical grip and just takes on a bit taller of a size like the R3 or the Z9. Sony didn't do that with the Alpha 1, and I think that there are goods and bads to this. I think one of the pros is gonna be for those minimalist filmmakers from our, our categories at the beginning of the video are gonna appreciate the more compact body because we're trying to take less stuff, take smaller things, get it to fit into a bag, and the compact size is gonna help with that. Being compact though, it still has a great grip, it has great ergonomics, and a very robust set of input and output ports. So I think they have done something, if nothing else, very interesting with the size and, and, and form factor of the A1. The biggest con, the biggest drawback of the A1 is gonna come from its high megapixel sensor. I mentioned it has a great backside illuminated stacked sensor, which is awesome, but it's very high megapixel. And in the confines of this video, looking for the best hybrid camera, that's gonna make this camera lean pretty heavy towards photo users and the video side of things begins to fall off. There's a couple of drawbacks of high megapixel sensors as it relates to videos. And the first one is gonna be oftentimes worse low light performance. And another thing that comes with that is in order to capture all that megapixel data in a video mode where we're trying to get 24 frames, 30 frames, 60 frames every second, we're asking for a lot of computing power out of this camera body and something has to give somewhere and it results in pixel binning. The A1 has to pixel bin a lot of data in order to capture a 4K60 image, which results in ultimately a lower quality image. And because of all of those reasons, it's gonna keep the A1 in spot three for our best hybrid camera of 2022. Let's move on to spot number two. And number two is also gonna come from Sony and that's gonna be the A7 IV. The A7 IV is the newest released camera on this list, and it's got some really good things going for it. The first of which is going to be incredible low light performance on this camera. It doesn't have the high megapixel count of the A1, and Sony is notorious for being the low light kings. And the A7 IV is another one of those cameras that gives you some, some incredible low light performance that you're not getting on any other cameras. And that's why this camera is going to take the number two spot and be really, really high on this list. Another real pro that you don't get with many other cameras is going to be the recording of gyro data. This is another really cool one that Sony does really well. They have IBIS already built into the camera, but in addition to that, you can use and capture the gyro data as you record say a handheld shot, that image is stored in the metadata of your file and using Sony's Catalyst Browse, you can add additional stabilization in post-production to taste, really. You can add more or less, and it's gonna do a much better job than something like, say, Warp Stabilizer in Premiere because it's working from actual gyroscopic data instead of trying to analyze and interpret unstable footage like, like Premiere is doing. So that's another cool pro. I think, Another more broad pro of the a7 IV and why it's gonna be so high on this list is just the overall reliability. You're not getting 30 minute record limits. You're not getting overheating. This camera just works. When you need it to work, it works. And, and, and it does so simply and, and effectively. So I really, I like that. And I've got a lot of really good things to say about the a7 IV and not a lot of cons. And that's why it's going to be so high. I don't have much to complain about the A7 IV or, or real drawbacks to it. If I had to pick one, and, and the reason maybe it takes spot two instead of spot one is going to be Sony's E-mount lenses. Um, I think they're really good. They're really, they're really solid lenses. They're just not as good as RF lenses. And that's going to lead us into the number one spot. And the number one spot is going to be reserved for the Canon R3. I think the Canon R3 is the best hybrid camera available on the market today. First reason, that backside illuminated stacked 24 megapixel sensor. Incredible sensor technology and just nails the sweet spot for megapixel count to give us great photos and great video performance. Perfect from a hybrid perspective. I think another real pro of the R3 is going to be the form factor. This has the built-in vertical grip. I know I mentioned on the A1 that I thought the compact 
form factor was was interesting and 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 there are people that are going to really like that i am in the camp of really appreciating the built-in vertical grip especially uh, fitting into that category of run and gun content creators that are shooting photos and videos kind of simultaneously you're creating content for your clients oftentimes you're shooting stuff for social media as well and as we all know that's going to be better suited towards vertical content. So having controls built into the camera to allow you to better capture that content, I think is great and adds even more versatility to what a hybrid camera can be. I really just don't have a lot of bad things to say about the R3 other than maybe the price because the price is pretty hefty, but the mission of this video was simply to find the best, not to find the best at a certain price range, just the best. And I think that the Canon R3 is the best hybrid mirrorless camera available in 2022. You got what you came here for, my list of the top five hybrid mirrorless cameras that are available now in 2022. As a bit of a bonus here at the end of the video, I've got a couple honorable mentions. Uh, and the first is gonna be the Canon R5C. On paper, this was supposed to be the number one on this list, right? It's supposed to be the best photo video camera that's available. Real world use, I don't think it's there. I think the battery life being as atrocious as it is, is gonna make this not usable for the things that I'm trying to use it for. So it doesn't make the list, but honorable mention at best because it does have some incredible capabilities to it, as long as you can work around the battery. Another honorable mention camera is going to be the Nikon Z6 Mark II. This is another feature packed camera that actually has all the prerequisites to make it onto the list but I think that its menu system isn't fully fleshed out and relatively to the other options available. The autofocus is also lacking and that doesn't help out our, our three categories of shooters. Um, they rely pretty heavily on autofocus, myself included. And that's gonna be one of the things that keeps it from making it onto the list, but a great camera nonetheless. One final camera to mention in this video, and it's gonna be in a category unto itself, and that is going to be future contenders. All right, and that camera is the Canon EOS R6 Mark II. I think the Mark II solves a lot of the issues that plagued the R6 and even the R5 you mentioned earlier. It's very recent, re recently released as of the time of recording this video, so it hasn't been tested out in the wild, so I don't wanna give it my formal recommendation yet, but it seems like it's, it's gonna check a lot of boxes, and if I were to make this video again in a year, I would suspect that camera makes it onto that list. And that will do it for Cameras Ranked Hybrid Mirrorless Edition. Now I know, and I mean I know that you have some thoughts on the topic. So let's move this conversation down to the comments below. Let me know if you agree or what you would change for your own personal list. On your way down to the comments, make sure you hit like, hit subscribe, do all the YouTube things. I will catch you down in the comments and I will see you in the next video.